as our ministers here. Let us hear from Minister Louis Farrakhan. In the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful, the one God to whom all praise is due, the Lord of the worlds, and in the name of his true servant and last messenger, our beloved leader, teacher, and guide, the messenger of Allah, the most honorable Elijah Muhammad, I'm very happy and honored to greet you, my beloved brothers and sisters, with the greeting words of peace in the Arabic language. Assalamu alaikum. I must say that again, I'm very happy to be home here at the Final Call Administration Building and uh, thankful to Almighty God for the privilege of being able to address this audience here at the Final Call Building and those of you who are listening over this radio station, WBEE, and those who are listening via telephone hookup throughout the United States and also in the Caribbean. I am very honored to have this privilege to talk with you. In the Holy Quran, there is a scripture that reads, after difficulty comes ease. God, in his infinite wisdom, allows his chosen people and his chosen vessels to undergo great difficulty. Difficulty is not meant to break them. Difficulty is meant to shape them, to prepare them for his divine purpose. After difficulty comes ease. Again in the Holy Quran, Allah says to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, did not I find you an orphan? Did not I find you groping and showed you the way? Allah says to Muhammad, your latter state will be better than your former state. These words were meant to comfort the Prophet of Islam as he was going through the trials of rejection of his own tribe, persecution, hatred, slander, vilification, maligning of his character, but he had to go through all of this and go through it with a certain character. When God puts upon his people a trial or an affliction, it is not that you go through it, but it is the manner that you go through it that determines the kind of character that you have. If you go through it cursing God with every step, he may be merciful to bring you through. But when you get on the other side after having cursed God and angered him with your pettiness and wondering why he would put you through this kind of affliction, after all, I've been faithful, I've said my prayers, I've tithed, I've done good, why would you, God, allow me to suffer like this? As though, you know, God is under some obligation because we pray and fast and observe our duty that he should make it so easy for us in this life. But Allah says, as he introduces these chapters of trial and suffering, he introduces these chapters by saying, I, Allah, am the best Noah, I created you in words. 
You are my servant. I want the best for you. But I cannot bring the best out of you that I have deposited in you if I make it easy for you. I brought you into a world, a world in which there is positive and negative. You were conceived in pleasure, but you were birthed in pain. I must give you the extremes. You must know joy and you must know sorrow. You must know pain and you must know pleasure. In order to understand the beauty of heaven, you must know the suffering of hell. You must, if you're going to reap the benefit of life, you must feel the sorrow and the pain of death. I brought you into the world and I give you these extremes in your life, not because I do not love you, but it is because I love you and I love myself and I know what I have put in you from myself for my glory. And since I created myself out of darkness and became light, then I want you to come the way that I have come, that you may evolve into me. I wonder, do you hear me? <laughs> that you may evolve into me. God wants to make us into himself. He cannot do that with a life of ease. He must do it with trial and tribulation and suffering. And as he brings you out of the suffering, he gives you joy, then puts you back into suffering again. He makes it hot, then he makes it cool. But he's forging a people for his glory. After difficulty comes ease. Difficulty is a trial, but so is ease. Because when God makes it easy for you, will you then go to sleep on your duty and your responsibility to him? Will you go to sleep and say, oh, well, I deserve this. I've been through a lot, you know. And time to pray? I'll pray another time. I'm busy now. I'm going to take a little nap. Well, you might nap out. Or as the boys who play dice say it, you may crap out. <laughs> you don't want to play games with your destiny. God tries you with both extremes. Isn't it wonderful when we are happy, we can say, oh, I am so happy. And you feel great. But whenever something comes into our lives that makes us sad. Maybe a death, an untimely death. Maybe we lose a loved one so very close to us. And then we entertain doubts about the greatness of God. Well, I want to say at this juncture of our subject matter that I do receive the reviling of me and the slander of me and the evil spoken of me with great joy. I am not the least bit disturbed. Not at all. In fact, I feel better today than I have felt in a long time. Because I know that after difficulty comes ease. And if I can go through the trial, no matter what it costs me, as a servant of God, I should be willing to pay whatever price is necessary to see the people redeemed. And if I say that I love black people, and I do say that, should not I be forced to prove it? Anybody can say that you love your people, but what is the proof of your love? 
The proof of your love of your people is that you must be willing to die for their sake, that they might have the joy of life. I feel this morning so very grateful to Almighty God for blessing me with that kind of spirit that I am only too happy to suffer. No matter what it is, even death itself, I believe that I would die a happy man, knowing that undeserved suffering is redemptive. I have not done anything of evil to deserve what these enemies are putting upon me and worse, what they plan against me. I have not done anything, not a thing. So because I am innocent of that which they charge me with, then I feel like that lamb that is to be offered as a sacrifice for the redemption of a people. I feel like a son of Abraham who even though Abraham was asked to sacrifice the son, the son was willing to be sacrificed if it would please God. I feel just like that myself. I love black people and I want to see them free. I want to see them independent. I want to see black people not bowing to no power on the earth or in the heaven above, but to the power of their God and their creator. I want to see black men and women in love with themselves and in love with one another. I want to see us up from the foot of a cruel slave master, building factories for ourselves and producing the things that we consume. I want to see black men and women flying their own planes that are built in our own factories, navigating our own ships that are built in our own shipyards. I want to see black men and women free. And I will never be satisfied if Reverend Jackson became president tomorrow, I would not stop pushing for what we feel black people must have because a black man sitting in a white house being manipulated by white people is not my idea of being free. A black man is mayor over a city that he does not control is not my idea of being free. If black people are to chart their own destiny, we must not only have an office, we must have the power that goes with that office to make the changes necessary that all who live under our rule may live under a just rule with peace and freedom and equality of opportunity. We cannot do this under this governmental system. Therefore, this system has to be removed and a new world order set up. And that is what they fear from my mouth. I don't represent this world. I represent a world that is coming in. about Farrakhan that he's censured by the vice president saying that he gets that censure direct from the president now think over that a little brother that just two weeks ago or six weeks ago was just a little quiet fella moving in and out around and about now the president censures me. The vice president censures me. The candidates running for office censure me. The Jewish leaders censure me. The Democratic committee 
censures me. Religious leaders fall well has come out and condemned me. Now, I should be beaten down by now with these heavy weights. But I ask the question, how come I don't feel the sting of your rebuke, but you quake at the sting of mine? I'm not trembling at all at you, but you tremble at what comes out of my mouth. I shut your mouths when I speak. You can't shut my mouth no matter what you threaten me with. Well, who am I then? I'm raising the question and I have the answer. Who am I in your midst? That you quake at my rebuke, but I don't shake at all. No matter if the Pope comes out against me, I will stop his mouth. up among you, that he don't fear your censure, but you fear his. Who's backing up his rebuke? If my rebuke causes you to shake, and your rebuke don't cause me even to (laughs) raise a hair, then who is backing my rebuke of you? And what kind of waning power is it that you have? that black people no longer care nothing about what you say. In the Holy Quran, in a chapter called The Food, Jesus is talking to his disciples. And when I reveal to the disciples saying, believe in me, this is Allah talking here, believe in me and my messenger, they said we believe and bear witness that we submit. And when the disciples said, O Jesus, son of Mary, is thy Lord able to send down food to us from heaven? Jesus said, keep your duty to Allah if you are believers. The disciples said to Jesus, we desire to eat of it, talking about a food coming down from heaven, that our hearts should be at rest and that we may know that thou hast indeed spoken the truth to us, that we may be witnesses thereof. Jesus, son of Mary, said, O Allah, our Lord, send down to us food from heaven, which should be to us an ever-recurring happiness to the first of us and the last of us, and a sign from thee, and give us sustenance, and thou art the best of the sustainers. Allah said, Surely I will send it down to you. But whoever disbelieves afterwards from among you, I will chastise him with a chastisement with which I will not chastise anyone among the nations. Now, I want us to just slow down a moment and we're going to think our way through this. Jesus' disciples 
are asking him for food from heaven. Now we know that Jesus is not representing just the bread, the daily bread that comes up from the earth. All the food that you eat right now, the source of its life is clouds and water which comes down from heaven, but the food comes up to you and not down to you. Is that correct? All right. But this kind of food is a food that is sent down, and it is not a food for the body as such. It is a food that would strengthen our hearts, that our hearts that are disturbed at this moment should be made at rest. And a confirming kind of food that bears witness that what Jesus said to them was and is the truth that they who are disturbed and somewhat confused might come alive again in that truth and become witnesses thereof. Then Jesus said, now he's praying, O oh, our Lord, Send down to us food from heaven, which should be to us an ever-recurring happiness. The word in Arabic is id. And after the fast of Ramadan, and after the hajj or pilgrimage, you have two feasts called Id, where food is prepared. And the Muslims have a sort of a festive, joyous occasion over food because they've come through a trial of 30 days of long, hard fasting. And they've come through 10 days of a trial in that they made the sacred pilgrimage to Mecca. After both of these trials, there is a feast called Id, where food is prepared and a festival of joy. When you add the 30 days of Ramadan with the 10 days of Hajj, you get 40 days. In the Quran, we are told that Allah gave Moses 30 nights and strengthened him with 10 more, meaning he had 40, 40 nights. All right, bear with me now. This is very significant to what I was talking about at the opening of uh, our talk this afternoon. Now, Jesus in the New Testament is telling his disciples, there are many things that I could tell you, meaning I know the truth, but because I don't tell it to you, it doesn't mean that I don't love you. There are many things that I could tell you, but you cannot bear it now. What does that mean? It means, beloved, that even though you hunger for the truth, you have to have a foundation mentally so that you will be prepared to accept certain truths. There are certain truths that you are ready to accept right now. But there are other truths which, if given to you before you are ready for them, will break you down. Jesus knew this. So he said to his disciples, there are many things that I could tell you. You just can't bear it now. But when he is come, talking about somebody else, the spirit of truth, he will guide you into all truth. Now, Jesus is saying, I'm going to send him unto you. That means that he is less than Jesus. 
Because he couldn't be equal to Jesus if he's sent by Jesus. He's a lesser man. But nevertheless, I'm going to send him unto you and he's going to testify of me. He's going to tell you things or bear witness of me because I was in your midst, but you didn't know me well. But I'm going to send you one who's going to testify of me. Jesus talking. Jesus speaks again. He says, I will pray the Father. Listen to these words. That he will send you another comforter. Now, Jesus being in the world is certainly a comforter to the people who yearn for righteousness. But he's about to leave the world. And he's telling his disciples, don't worry. I'm not going to leave you like this. I'm going to pray the Father. And he will send you another comforter. I'm a comforter, but this one when he comes, he'll be a comforter too. He'll be like a warm blanket in a chilly night. It won't be me, but it'll be from me. So if you accept him, you're accepting me. Look at these words now. Notice what he's supposed to do. He is supposed to testify of Jesus, but he's also supposed to rebuke two worlds. He rebukes the world of sin and the world of judgment because they believe not in me. All right. Now, when that man comes into the world, from the Jesus, listen carefully, testifying of that Jesus, bearing witness of that Jesus, bringing us into truths about the man that we were not able to bear when the man was among us, comforting us, with the understanding. Then he rebukes the world of sin and of judgment. When he rebukes both those worlds, that rebuke is backed up by the Father and by Jesus. So the power of his rebuke is nothing to play with. I wonder, are you listening? Now, this food that Jesus is praying for is a strengthening kind of food. Have you noticed that whenever God sends a major prophet, he always deals with the people's diet? Moses came to Israel, and he had to stop Israel from eating the kind of food that Israel was eating. Because Pharaoh's diet was not a good diet for Israel. Is that right? Jesus talked about food, didn't he? Muhammad talked about food, didn't he? You got three great men of God, all of them changing the diet of the people. Now, don't you realize, beloved, that if you and I are going to be made a great people, we can't be made a great people eating the filth of the earth and the filth of the sea. We must be taught how to eat better than what we are eating. For as food from the earth nourishes the cells of our body, builds up the blood which pours over the brain, and helps to bring up vision, then a people that eat dirty, unclean foods cannot have a clean body, nor can they think clean thoughts. So when God wants to make a people for his glory, he must start with their diet. He must start with their food. Is that right? Okay. But it don't, doesn't stop there. He gives you a better way to eat. 
and a better way to eat will actually start you thinking better. Food actually can make you think certain kinds of thoughts. S refraining from certain kinds of foods will actually make you have a different disposition, even change the nature. People that eat a lot of meat, watch out now. People that eat red meat, blood running out of it, make mine rare. They are like the beast. God gives animals the teeth to cut meat. And they cut it and they pull it. You don't have teeth like that. Some of you may be trying to get some like that. You don't have teeth like that. Your mouth is not made for that kind of eating. This is true. The more you eat meat, you become of the same spirit of those animals that eat meat. You become more warlike. So the meat-eating nations of the earth are really the warlike nations. Those vegetarian nations of the earth and those that eat uh, uh, life from the sea are more peaceful. That's true. There's something about food that shapes sometimes the way you think. When God wants to make a people for his glory, he must change the way they eat. All right? We're dealing with food now. Well, once you start changing the way of people eat, you start preparing the vessel for something better to come into the brain. Now the real food is food sent down from heaven. What food is that? Now, you've never seen corn, you know, fall down or some nice vegetables fall out of the sky. What you look for from heaven is knowledge. For it is only knowledge and wisdom and understanding that eases the heart rests the heart when you're going through a trial, when you're going through tribulation. It's knowledge, isn't it? And knowledge confirms what you were taught by a great teacher or denies it. Are you listening? We have had in our midst a great teacher, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. And it is my uh, thinking that even though he worked among us 40, notice the words, 40 years, and they were considered night, 40 nights. Why? Because the sun of truth had not dawned on the darkness of our hearts and minds. Light shined in the darkness, but the darkness comprehended it not. Forty nights, because we were ignorant in that night. Ignorant of the man that was in our midst, ignorant of the truth that he taught, ignorant of the God that raised him up for our salvation. All right. Forty days and forty nights, then the Honorable Elijah Muhammad is no longer among us. Now we undergo a trial. The Caucasian people of this world were very happy when they heard that Elijah Muhammad was dead. In fact, they tell me at 10 minutes past 8 on that Saturday morning at Mercy Hospital, the doctors walked out to the Muslims who were there and said with a smile on his lips, the man known as Elijah Muhammad is dead. Their joy was, he's gone now. Their next trepidation was, will the new leader follow in the footsteps of his father? 
They already knew that the new leader did not agree with his father. So if the new leadership did not agree with the father, then the new leadership would follow a new direction. And that new direction did not trouble the government. And since it did not trouble the government, let us help that new direction. But what about the guy Farrakhan? Should we kill him? Well, let us try to make sure that he never rises again. Spread lies on him. Say that he robbed the people to live in luxury. Make the people who loved him turn to hate him on the basis of lies. This is always the way the enemy goes when he goes after somebody that the people love. You must turn love into hate because love will make men and women stand and face death for their loved ones. This is why Paul speaks in Corinthians about the power of love. Love overcomes all. Love feareth nothing. So when people love each other, it is difficult for Satan to break in there and pull his game. So Satan must turn love into hate by lies mixed with truth or outright lies made to look like truth, then the people that loved you turn to hate you, then the enemy can move on you. As long as Jesus was surrounded by the people and loved by the people and believed in by the people, the powers of government could not get to Jesus. They said we must turn the people against Jesus. So they kept sending people to question Jesus. Maybe today you call them reporters, but in that day, they were a different kind of reporter. Their object was to listen to your words, weigh them carefully, find anything in those words that they could say uh, meant blasphemy or sedition or some crime that the government could use to get at you. They took my words made here less than a month ago, twisted them about, trying to make mischief for me. I threatened the reporter. The FBI brought the tape to the U.S. Attorney's Office, saying to him, go through it, see if we can make a charge on the man. I knew they had nothing from the beginning. And I said so before 30 million American people that if I'm guilty of such as threatening the life of a, of a reporter, I have offended the law, then arrest me, charge me, and bring me in a court of law and prove your charge. I knew they could not do such, and they knew they could not do such. But they strung out a so-called investigation. Then they released it yesterday. We have no, uh, 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 we cannot prove criminal intent beyond a shadow of a doubt. They still would not say I never threatened the man. They said they just couldn't go in a court of law and make it stick. But I know all the time that they are now exonerating me in a sense. From that, they are already working on something else. I am not blind. I told the press in Washington, D.C., and I say it again to those who are listening. I know you better than you know yourself. And I said to them in Washington, do whatever you want to do to me, and I will open up the Bible and the Holy Quran and show you your footsteps. I'm fulfilling what is written of me, and you are fulfilling what is written of you. Send down this food. 
from heaven that should be an ever-recurring happiness to the first of us and the last of us and a sign from thee and give us sustenance and thou art the best of the sustainers. But look at what Allah said. I'm going to send it down to you. But whoever disbelieves afterward from among you, I will chastise him with a chastisement with which I will not chastise anyone among the nations. Now this is serious. Because it is saying to us that when God makes the truth for you so plain that a fool would not find or would find it difficult to make a mistake. And then after that truth is made known, you turn your back on that truth after you pray and ask God to confirm or deny what you had been taught. And he confirms it for you and you still won't stand by it. Then you are headed into the chastisement of Almighty God. Now, I know we're in the last five minutes of this radio broadcast, but I'm not quite through with this subject. So I'm going to go on a few minutes. And those of you who are listening for the sake of a lie on the outside, maybe you have time to come over so you can get the rest of it. Now, beloved, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad departed from us in 1975. And now, in 1984, one of his disciples or students is now affecting the country. They thought they had gotten rid of my father. Now a sun rises up. But what they hear coming from the mouth of the sun is even more stinging than what they heard coming from the mouth of the father. No, I want you to listen. Because now my work is to reprove this world. Take it or let it alone. I'm not to bow down to the president. Sorry. You bow. If you want to. My job is to lash the government. Lash the leaders. Because a man from God was in your midst and you did not listen to him. My work is to lash the Middle East and the Islamic world. Take it or let it alone. I'm not to bow to nobody on the earth. My job is to rebuke both worlds. Because the man was a Muslim. He came into a Judeo-Christian world. And Jews and Christians with a Bible full of prophecies that you have in your hand. You could have easily, if your hearts were not so perverse and your ears so dull of hearing, you could have heard Elijah, looked in the book and said, uh, this must be the one. You could have made it easier on yourselves. But no, you opposed him. You plotted against his life. Well, okay then. The Islamic world, you heard the man say he's the messenger of Allah. He never backed down in 40 years, even though the whole Islamic world believes that Prophet Muhammad of Arabia is the last of the prophets. Elijah Muhammad said, I am the messenger of Allah to you all. He never backed down. And the Islamic world did not believe him and worked against him. Now his son has arisen. I'm not here to 
make peace with you except on the terms of God. I must speak the truth or die. I'm not here to placate the Jews because the Jews have had the prophets and the scriptures. You have had it in your possession and I speak directly out of that scripture and you do to me as you did to my father. As the book says, they won't hear you because they didn't hear me. But when you turn me down, I'm telling you, you can call it a threat because that's exactly what it is. Death and destruction comes after I finish my message. You may laugh and say the man has gone crazy. He's overcome with himself. You check America out. Check out the tornadoes that are lashing America. Check out the weather. You haven't seen nothing yet. I'm not here, beloved. I say this again and again. You think it's just Farrakhan you're dealing with. No. I'm backed by the two most powerful beings in the universe, God and his Christ. You can take it or let it alone. court, but they don't want to bring me on these flimsy charges because they know that won't stand up. So they are working feverishly to find something with which they can charge me and try to make it stick to turn your, your love of me into hate. They have already tested the black community and they don't see weakness there. They see the imam has come out against me, but they don't pay that too much attention because he don't have the power of the people anymore. But last night, when they were probing Nancy Jefferson, when they were probing Alderman uh, Kelly, when they were probing that wonderful reverend from Push, Mr. Gannett, I think. Harden. Harden. Thank you. <laughs> Why, that wonderful brother, he was so brilliant. Every time they fired on him, he backed them up. Miss Nancy Jefferson backed them up. Alderman Kelly, the supreme consummate politician, he yet lashed them and backed them up. And when they went away, they had to be reporting in the Jewish circles. We tried. God knows we tried. But those niggers, those niggers, they wouldn't budge. We even tried to call Farrakhan a black Klansman, yes, and they rejected it straight out. Yes, Don't ahead. talk about my brother like that. Yes, what was the miracle that Jesus performed that made the people to love him so? Jesus went to the tomb of a man named Lazarus and said, Lazarus, come forth. And when Lazarus came out of the tomb, his hands were bound, his feet were bound, a napkin was around his eyes. And Jesus said, loose him and let him go. What is it that makes the people show love and respect for Farrakhan? Farrakhan went to the tomb of the nation of Islam that was dead and said, Lazarus, come forth. And my brothers and sisters came forth with
with a napkin around their eyes, their hands bound, their feet bound. And by the grace of Almighty God, I said, loose him and let him go. And now the nation is up again, right? That that was dead is alive now. Is that right? That that was lost is now found. Is that right? That that was blind can now see. Is that right? That you don't have to look for Jesus. He's right here. footsteps and I'm willing to die to see the people free now they're so afraid of me they're plotting night and day I said plot on because I already know I have a rendezvous with destiny I already know what's coming down the road and I've been born to meet it and overcome it you will never kill me You will never kill me. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. Sorry about that. There's something when the white man can't frighten you anymore. There's something when a God has come into your life and made your heart at ease. It is something when you feel you are in his bosom, wrapped up in his power, that no man can get to you from where you are. I am like that in your midst. They can't touch me. They can't harm me unless it pleases Almighty God. And if it pleases God, I am ready. Been ready. I'm not on Reverend Jackson's platform. I'm on my own. So don't accuse me of saying something against the candidacy. I'm on my platform, and I can't stop speaking. When I met Reverend Jackson, I was already speaking. Condemn me as a liar. You can't do it. I said Hitler was wickedly great. He most certainly was. Satan is great. Otherwise, he couldn't be a fit opponent for a great and mighty God. Satan is great, but he's not good. Charlie Chaplin called Hitler the great dictator. None of you raised your voices. You called the depression the great depression. Many people suffered under it, but you call it the Great Depression. I said Hitler was a great man, skilled and wickedly skilled. I spoke absolutely truth. In order to destroy what I said, you might as well tear up your dictionary. did you say he had a good name? Because he struck terror into the hearts of his enemies. And if I am striking terror into the hearts of those who have terrorized black people for 400 years, then my name is a good name if it frightens you into doing what is right. Well, Mr. Farrakhan, uh, uh, the Civil Rights Commission has said that uh, Jesse better leave you. 
What do you got to say about that? Why, the president himself <laughs> said that you're a bad fella. And uh, one that looks like he's going to be the nominee of the party. Why, he said your words were poison. What are you going to do about that, Mr. Farrakhan? Nothing. <laughs> this is a little different kind of fella than you used to dealing with. By the grace of Almighty God, I don't fear the censure of any censurer. I represent a new generation. I'm not a young man but I represent a new generation. And you know what? So do you. You are not the same old Negroes. You are a new people. I recognize God in you. And that's why I bow to my brothers and sisters because I recognize God in you. When I see Nasee, I see Elbin Israel, and all of my brothers and sisters in the Hebrew Israelites, I bow. Why do you bow? I see God. When I see Rabbi Ben Ami, why do you bow? I see God. When I see strong black men like Jesse Jackson standing up, refusing to bend his knees, I bow. Why do you bow? I see God. When I see these young men who are gangbanging right now, swaggering down the street with a mean look on their face, I see God working in those young people. When I saw my little sister here, 12 years old, sing her rap song about Jesse, I bowed. I knew I was looking at God in that little 12-year-old girl because God is making us a new people. This is a new reality, a new day. That's why Jesse says our time has come. Our time has indeed come. I wonder, do you recognize the spirit that is moving in you? It's not a common spirit. It's his spirit moving in you and me. You're a new woman. And you're a new man. The Quran says Allah will raise up a new generation. Why a new generation, Allah? I don't like the old one. Moses had to wander 40 days in the wilderness. And when they got out, of uh, Egypt, pardon me, into the wilderness. It was an 11 day journey. Took them 40 years. Why, rebels? People were just full of rebellion. God looked at him and said, It's all right. It's all right. Just let them wander around in circles. I'll let them wander till they move rebellious ones die out, I'll take their children. And they will inhabit the promised land. I don't care if your hair is gray today. You're a new woman. I don't care if your hair is bald today, black brother. You're a new man. You have made it to the hour of renewing. And you and I are being renewed. That's why white folks are pulling their hair out. How can I deal with them? Come on, I shoot the same juice that used to lay them out. Yes, sir. And they dance. He <laughs> turn up the juice and we go to break dancing on. <laughs> he can't handle this, brother. This is a new people. Now, we could break black folks up before. 
Jesse, aren't you going to repudiate him? No, I'm not. I'm going to go back and try him again in the next city. He goes to the next city. Jesse, repudiate that Farrakhan. They said, I answered that in the last city. I said it again. No, I'm not. They bite their teeth. They go in the back room and say, good God Almighty. Well, let's offer Jesse something. See, will he get rid of Firecon? Jesse, stand up again. No, I'm not. They don't come to me. Because I don't want nothing in the world. You can't offer me nothing. You could offer me the presidency, I would turn it down. Go ahead. Because I know what seat that is. That's the electric chair. Now, whoever the next president is, watch the jokes that he gets. You see him going to office looking young, and after a few days, you see the wrinkles pop out on him, brother. That's a hell of a seat, man, because the house is being torn apart as they have sown. Now is their time to reap. God didn't want Jesse in that seat. He's too good a man to be president. He deserves better than that. Brother won Louisiana last night. I listened to white folks announcing it this morning on television. Looked like they had locked jaw, you know. Trying to make excuses of the, well, the people didn't get out like they should, huh? So Jesse won. Man, looked like he went cross-eyed for a minute. And can you imagine them white people? Can you imagine what they're thinking? The gall of this young man, Jesse Jackson. I love that brother so. Don't you? He's different, isn't he? He's a new Jesse, isn't he? They don't know what to do with that new Jesse, do they? God said, I'm going to do a new thing in that day. Go ahead. They can't figure this thing out. Too much for them. You better believe it. I need God to make me totally new. I don't want nothing left of the old. No. That's what the scripture means when it says that I die in order that he might live in me. See, we got to put this old world to death in us that a new world could come to birth in us. It's that that they don't have any power over and it's that that they are unable to handle. Now I'm going to conclude. <laughs> Notice Moses in the wilderness wanted, they wanted manna to come down from heaven. I want you to think about this. Talking about food again. Listen well now. David says, Thou spreadest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Jesus comes into the world and notice his words. I am 
the bread of heaven. Oh, that's a heavy word. Then he tells the people, as he's about to leave them, he says, Take my body. Eat it in remembrance of me. This is my blood. And likewise, after supper, it says he took the cup and he told them, this is my blood that I shed for the remission of sins. And I think in some writings it says for the New Testament. Drink this as oft as you can in remembrance of me. Feed on me in your heart. Boy, this man is talking. And people are looking and they don't understand what he's doing. Feed, hey, I ain't no cannibal. What's wrong with this man? He want me to eat his flesh. Drink his blood. Moses just told us that the blood of all things is unclean. You don't drink the blood of any animal. How then does this man want me to drink his blood? What is this? Now, Jesus don't have but a few pints of blood. He don't have enough for everybody <laughs> that believes to drink. And he don't have enough flesh, poor man. If we all wanted to eat a little of Jesus' flesh, we would eat him up in a short time. <laughs> you know it doesn't mean that. It's beautiful, but it doesn't mean that. No. Jesus goes away. Peter rises up. Peter's hungry. And this table or sheet comes down out of the sky for Peter. It's a vision. He looks at it, sees all kind of four-legged animals on this sheet. And he was told to eat it. And in the vision, he said, wait, wait, wait a minute. I can't eat them kind of things. That's unclean. And he's rebuked in the vision that what I have cleansed past perfect tense or present perfect tense, what I have cleansed, you can eat. Peter is trying to figure out what it means. Some of my Christian brothers and sisters say it means you can eat anything. And then you lay into that pork chop. <laughs> lay into those brains, chitterlings, stinking up the house for days. They haven't even made an air refresher that can move the stench of chitterling. I mean, chitterlings. <laughs> 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 I glad you. <laughs> now you know. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> I, I didn't mean it that way. Just it came out that way. Forgive, forgive me, y'all, but kind of smells. <laughs> Here you are. Bless your hearts. When I leave you today, some of you going home. <laughs> to get into that kind of nastiness. And then you're going to say, well, it tastes good. There's a lot of things that taste good, but are not good for you. And the hog is one of those fellas. It's a nasty creature. One day I'd like to talk on it and tell you not only 
what it's made from, but why God permitted it to be made in the first place. It is not good for you to eat. I know you like the bacon. I know you like the ham. <laughs> and let me tell you, I used to eat it up. So I'm not condemning you, because I loved it too. Every New Year's, my mother would cook a hog head. <laughs> I used to see that ugly fella sitting in my kitchen. <laughs> and my mother would make that hog head cheese, you know. We call it in the Caribbean South meat. Yes, sir. Man, that thing used to taste so good. And when I became a Muslim and went home and told my mother I didn't eat that stuff, she climbed all over me. <laughs> Boy, I raise you on this thing. <laughs> she, didn't, she didn't understand. But let me tell you, brothers and sisters, when an animal is that filthy, that it'll eat anything and everything and nothing makes it sick. <laughs> that hog is used to clean out swamps sometimes with snakes. Snake lay on that hog, bite him good, sink the venom down, and the hog still walking. That means that the poison of that animal is greater than the venom of a snake. It is a slow death for its eater. When you eat the hog, this is the truth. You think when you cook it at high temperature that you've killed the trick now worm that's in it. So you say, well, we cooked it real good. <laughs> Only in the South, they hang it up in a smokehouse to cure it. Anything you got to cure means it's sick. <laughs> and if you couldn't cure it live, it's sure enough you can't cure it dead. <laughs> <laughs> it up now. And that thing got all them little trick now worms in it. You eat that fella, you digest him, tastes good going down. Hmm. After a while, that little worm activates and it starts moving in your intestines. Works its way into joints and muscles forming cysts. You start talking about arthritis. I wonder why I get this pain so. Doctor sometimes will tell you, well, just leave off the pork. You go and tell him you've got high blood pressure. First thing he asks you, what are you eating? Leave the pork alone until your pressure comes down. He won't tell you cut out the pork altogether because he wants you coming back to get a few more dollars from you. Your food is killing you. The food that you're eating is destroying your health and well-being. Okay? When that worm reaches the spinal cord, it travels right along that spinal cord into the brain. Once you get it up in the brain, the messenger says you will never get it out of your system. Takes a long time for the trick now worm to get out of your system. Brothers and sisters, food keeps you here. Food takes you away. Eat the best that your money can buy. Stay away from the poison animal the pig. No meat is good for you at all. 
But if you must wean yourself away, stop first by not eating hog. Don't do it. If you want to make a little test, get a little piece of hog. Put it under a glass and leave it there for a few days and see what you come back and find. You notice our eyes, they're not white, especially the men. Women's eyes are clearer because they have a natural system of cleansing their bodies once every 30 days, but poor you, brother. These eyes all yellow, you know, red. Just don't have a good color in the eye. It's just bad food, bad drink, taking you slowly away. When you eat hog, it slows down the mental process. It sounds the mental powers, and it robs you of your beauty appearance. You notice how Muslims kind of have a good look about them. You notice that? You know we look different. And I know, you know, whether you are man or woman, when you look at Muslims, you see that clean look in our faces, our eyes kind of bright. It's not that we are any different from you. It's just the food that we eat makes us cleaner on the inside. You are beautiful people if you stop eating foods that damage your powers of thinking and you think bad thoughts and eat bad foods and you become a very ugly people. You don't want to be ugly, do you? These people telling you try this skin cream and that skin, you will have pretty skin. <clears throat> Try stop eating that bad food. Try fasting a little bit. Your skin will get so pretty. Your eyes will be so bright. People will ask you what kind of beauty treatment you're taking. <laughs> and truth is the best beauty treatment that any people could receive. Now I think I can go home and let you go home. The food. The food that Peter saw was not actual animals. It was human beings who were unclean. But God wanted Peter to stop hanging out, and so to speak, with the Jews and to stop going among the Gentiles who were called unclean. Because God was getting the Gentiles ready to receive the message of Jesus Christ. So Peter started consuming the Gentiles. Consuming meaning making them a part of the body of Christ. That's what it means. Paul comes along and takes it up. And he becomes the great preacher or apostle to the Gentiles. Is that right? Okay. How does that translate into today? 1984. Muslims, bear with me now. Now, I am sure that most of you who are learning of Elijah Muhammad, you now must think, who was this man really? We didn't like him so much when he was among us. Those of us that heard him and we didn't understand him, it was kind of frightening the way he talked about white people, you know? And prophesied the doom of America. Now, beloved, this coming Friday, it's not for the public, but God willing, I hope to do 10 to 14 hours straight of taping, videotaping. Scholars are coming in from around the country to question me on the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad 
from the making of the devil to the concept of God to food to the role of women to the tragedy of the Malcolm era what happened with Imam Warik Dean Muhammad all the way to the modern times and the critics and what they have to say the program of Elijah Muhammad his position and where we see ourselves going in the future there'll be scholars great eminent scholars coming of religion people that have watched the nation for years and we're going to put this on tape because we know the press will never tell our story the television will never show our truth this is something we have to do ourselves and if we have to pay for it we will show it to the world hour after hour after we raise the money to put it before the world now I say that to say that what Elijah Muhammad taught I mean it is the truth this coming Friday God willing I want to go into the making of a devil and right after that I'm going to teach it on the radio I hope that we will have sufficient time to show you why Elijah Muhammad used the language to white people that they are devils we don't want you to just go out calling names that's ugly and it's childlike but if God used that language why did he use it what message was he trying to say can white people escape that which he called them we got to put it out there there's a lot that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad taught that most of the people of the world have never heard nor reasoned with if you did hear it now beloved putting it in a modern context this man stood in our midst for 40 years and there was much that he could have told us we just were not ready what about his domestic life what about the things that Malcolm charged him with is there truth to it if so how should we look at it the world has to know these things you know why we have got to put to rest the fighting among ourselves we have to put it to rest there are people in this audience who adore Malcolm and think well of Elijah Muhammad and there are people in this audience who adore Elijah Muhammad think well of Malcolm and there are some who adore Malcolm and don't think anything of Elijah Muhammad there are some who adore Elijah Muhammad don't think anything of Malcolm X how long should this controversy rage on must another generation of children come up wearing the scars of something that happened before they were born why not analyze it critically appraise it and let it be in the past that the children may go on I was in uh, Washington DC a few weeks ago and a tall stately child looked like a woman to me came up to me as I was standing there and said assalamu alaikum I said wa alaikum salam she said Attila Shabazz here and turned and walked away I didn't recognize it was Malcolm's daughter I said Attila because when she was a baby she was at my knee and when my oldest daughter was a baby she was at Malcolm's knee and Malcolm taught my oldest daughter her ABC and taught her her student enrollment and I did a similar thing not quite as much as Malcolm with Attila and there was the daughter of Malcolm within my reach 
I wanted to grab her and embrace. Not grab. Well, you know what I mean. I wanted. I wanted to embrace her. When I called, she put her finger up, as if to say, "I've gone far enough." In words, there's still something between us. I said in my heart, you know, my children should be with Malcolm's children. Malcolm's children and Martin's children and my children and Jesse's children and Emmanuel Dean's children and Herbert's children and all of the children should be together. represent something new and they should not be settled down with old hatreds therefore if understanding and light is shed on the whole situation and it is opened and aired and analyzed then maybe we can put it behind us and get on with the business of building a people We must break down these barriers. Don't you think we should? Yes, sir. I do. <laughs> Beloved, Elijah Muhammad was a greatly misunderstood man. He is gone from us. And I feel it's my duty and my obligation to help others to understand him. Someone wrote, Farrakhan is carrying a lot of baggage, meaning carrying the, the baggage of what the people have said about Elijah Muhammad. That's very easy for me to carry. For he carried us. And we were heavy weights on him. But he didn't mind that. So I don't mind carrying his teaching and his message. And whatever the critics say about him, I will carry that. But I do think now we need to understand and get it behind us so we can go on with the work of building a great people. So, I say, in conclusion, that the food that God has sent down is a food that will rest our hearts from the pain of division. Isn't it beautiful that Christians and Muslims and Hebrew Israelites can stand together, laugh together, eat together, work together, fight together for the glory of God. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't it wonderful yeah. that... <laughs> that Hebrew Israelites and Muslims and Christians can sit down together at a common table. We have differences of view, but we handle it with such love and respect. The love is so overpowering, it makes our differences sink almost into nothingness. Now look, brothers and sisters, if those white Christians and Jews and Muslims can't get along, we have to show them how it's done. We must not allow the old Jews 
all Christians, all Muslims, to put their hatreds on us. We are trying to bring in a new world. So we cannot carry the baggage of that old order. So when you sit down together, the Muslim sister, the Hebrew Israelite, your dress is a little different, but yet long and respectful. You look at each other, you admire each other's styles. Pretty soon you'll say, I like that. You know how women are. I like that. Pretty soon you make a dress like that. She may look at something that the Muslim sister has on and say, mm, I like that. Before you know it, you won't be able to tell one community from another, brother and sister. Look at our Christian sisters and our Christian brothers. Here we are together. Nobody looking down at the other. We're looking at each other to learn from one another. You have much to teach us. We have much to share with you, and together, look how we learn. And before you know it, the Muslim, like I watched the Muslims when we were at T.L. Barrett's church. I peeped y'all. I know y'all peeped me too. Did you see me sitting there patting my feet? You see, we don't have music in the temple. You know, and I'm, I love music. So when I go to church, I mean, I just can't help myself. <laughs> when they start to lay in there with that heavy music, I go to patting my foot, you know, and I have been very, you know, austin. <laughs> but now, you know, your brother just break loose, you know? Go ahead. And I feel at home in the church. I'm getting something there that I don't get here. And when they come here, they get something here that they don't get there. <laughs> sisters start wrapping their heads. Other sisters said, what is that you got on? Why you do that? I like the way that looks. Before you know it, she wrap her head. Where did you get your head done? It looks so pretty. Oh, I got it done over here. Oh, that, uh, well, give me her name. Before you know it, you're all meeting in the same places. When you see each other, you rush into each other's arms. You embrace each other. You don't seem like you're strangers. You are a family. And this is what's driving the white man crazy. He don't want to see us recognizing each other as a family. <laughs> it's over. It's a new day. As Muslims, like the early Jews, we were kind of stuck on ourselves. Come on now. Yes, we, we have the truth. We are the righteous, you know. Look at that sister with that mini dress. Isn't she disgusting? Forgot how we used to put on the mini dress. I mean, not me. We acted kind of childlike. We had something very good, but we didn't sort of share it, you know? We had a nice school. The discipline was wonderful. The curriculum was wonderful, but we didn't let others share it. This is not a criticism. We had to get our own thing together. But now, we can't do that anymore. I saw a table come down from heaven. And it had all kind of meat on it. And I was told to eat. Not that I personally was told. I'm giving you a picture of the scripture coming to life. Yes, While we, what, 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 what? We can't eat this. We what? These people, they eat pork. What? Yes. That man was just snorting cocaine. I, I saw him, yes. I, that, uh, I saw that, that sister with a beer bottle in her hand. I can't hang out with her. I mean, after all. See? But when the nation broke up, 
Allah helped us to see that we were no better than the people we condemned. So we went back and got the cocaine, didn't we? Some of us. We went back and got the wine bottle and something else. So we don't have that old self-righteous posture anymore. I saw the table come down from heaven and what God is saying, what I have cleansed, you have no right to turn it down. This is your family. Go out and embrace one another. So now the Muslims and Brother Farrakhan, I don't stay here. I come here every once in a while the Muslims see me. I know you're a little disappointed. Their brother don't stay home. But see, my home is wherever black people are. You understand? And that's my home. So don't look for me to be all up here with you. And you are all here with me. That's our minister. Uh-uh. God didn't send me just to you. See, I belong to our people. Therefore, wherever our people are, if the mountain won't come to Muhammad, what must Muhammad do? Go to the mountain, brother. Okay. Now, two parables and we go. All right. All right. I ain't been home in so long, I can't help myself. Come on. Two parables. Moses in the Quran in the 18th chapter was traveling in search of knowledge. Do you remember the parable? Yes. Moses was kind of trifling, according to the parable. The wise man told him, look, Moses, you can't, in words, hang out with me. Moses said, oh, yeah, I can hang tough. <laughs> this is a modern translation, of course. <laughs> and, and Moses said, okay, man, walk with me. I, I, I'm almost willing to wager that you can't walk with me. So when they were walking, they came to a, a river, and a man had a boat. And the man was kind enough to take them across the river in his boat. When they got to the other side, the wise man put a hole in the boat sunk the man's boat after the man let him use the boat to get across. Moses jumped in the man's face and said, this is a terrible thing that you have done. The man says, I told you, you wouldn't have patience with me. Oh, he said, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, but, but that isn't too cool what you did. So they walked on a little further. This is really pardon translation. <laughs> but I want you to get the principles, okay? <clears throat> Here's a woman and a husband, a man and a woman, they had a baby. And he meets the man, he meets the woman, he sees the baby. He causes the baby to die. The poor man and woman is grieving over the loss of the baby. Moses and the wise man keep walking. Moses jumps dead off and the wise man says, Now this is terrible. This is a grievous thing. You killed the woman's baby. He says, I told you that you could not have patience with me. Now if you do this one more time, we'll have to part company. They went and they were very, very hungry. And uh, they went to a place and they asked the person, I guess, did you have any food? And the man wouldn't feed him. Wouldn't feed him. They went outside and there was a wall torn down. And in the wall, there was a treasure. The wise man built the wall back up, hiding the treasure in the wall. Both of them hungry now. So Moses said, look. I, you know, look. We hungry. The man got a book down wall. Why didn't you tell the man, lay some food on us, and we'll fix the wall. And then you see the treasure. And you didn't even take the treasure. You know what I mean? You build the wall back up. It sounds like us, don't it? <laughs> Well, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said, 
That's not a parable of Moses following the wise man, but that's a picture of a people who are given a messenger, and they don't have patience to wait for understanding of the things that the messenger is guided to do. And when God does a thing, he does it out of the comprehensiveness of his own knowledge. He has a consummate knowledge of the past, the present, and the future, and he makes a move today for tomorrow. You don't know tomorrow, hardly see today, not acquainted with yesterday. So you make a quick judgment and say, God, you are because you don't understand. Do you, you, you follow my point? Yes, sir. All right, now I tie that in with this verse of Scripture. And we go. Oh, you who believe, should any one of you turn back from his religion, then Allah will bring a people whom he loves and who love him, humble towards believers, mighty against the disbelievers, striving hard in Allah's way, and not fearing the censure of any censurer. This is Allah's grace. He gives it to whom he pleases, and Allah is ample giving and knowing. Now we end. Don't you see, beloved, in your life and in mine, there are things that happen that you don't understand. And those things that happen in your personal life or in our national life that we don't understand, we do have a tendency to make a judgment. And sometimes we make such a harsh judgment, we turn away from a friend. We turn away from our mothers. We turn away from our fathers or our husbands or our wives because of something that came up that we don't understand. While if we could have just held on a little longer and had a little more patience, understanding might have come to show us the wisdom of God in what was done. Now, you see the picture. The wise man said to Moses, we must part company. And now I will explain to you why I did what I did. When the man took me across and you across in the boat, he was such a good man. And I knew that a wicked king was coming behind, confiscating the boats of the people. So I put a hole in the man's boat that the wicked king would not see it because it would be sunk. And when the wicked king will have passed over, that man could retrieve his boat, plug up the hole, and sail on. Would that you had patience with me. When I met this righteous couple who had a child, I saw that if the child were allowed to live, that child would grieve his righteous parents. So I took the life of that child in its youth. Yes, the parents were troubled, but they would have been more troubled had that child grown up to bring grief on the parents. But I also gave that parent, those parents, a righteous child that will make the parents happy. So the happiness and the joy of a righteous child will make them forget the loss of the child that they had. And now, when I got to that house and I saw the wall there with the treasure in the wall, you were thinking about your stomach. But I saw in the future, too often, boys, that that uh, 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 money was meant for. And I knew that if these in that house who were so niggardly had seen that treasure, they would have usurped it. So I built a wall around the treasure, knowing that at the proper time and under the right circumstances, those two orphan boys would find that wall and find that treasure. This is why you cannot have patience with me, because you see only today. You see only your need. You do not see what God sees. 
And so you must trust in God in order for God to guide you when you don't understand what he is doing. Now the meaning of that. Look at the nation of Islam. How we love the nation. Look at what Elijah Muhammad built up for black people. It was like a ship. An old ship of Zion that we were in. The ship never did get lost. A hole was put in it. And when a king would come that would not be righteous, confiscating the boats, I allowed this one to sink because when the wicked king would have done his job, all we would have to do is bring it up from the bottom, put a hole, uh, plug the hole back up, clean it up, and there would be your nation of Islam never having gone any place, but you couldn't have patience with me. And there was a righteous parent, two of them, and they had a child, and that child was called the old nation of Islam. That child had become corrupt, and I knew that if the child had lived it would have grieved its righteous parents, Master Farad Muhammad and the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. So I allowed that child to die, knowing that I'm going to bring up a new child, a new nation that would give joy to those parents. And lastly, but not least, I know in order for that nation to survive, it's going to need money. And so I buried the treasure for that nation in a wall. And there were two little orphan boys deprived of both their mother and their father, knowing they have a nation on their shoulders. But I have prepared a treasure for them in advance. But I hid it. And at the proper time, under the right circumstances, they'll go to the right wall. And there will be the money needed to go on and build the nation. You see, you couldn't have patience with me. And because you did not have patience, we must part company. And many of us parted company with the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and his teachings. So the Quran says, O oh, you who believe, should any one of you turn back from his religion, then Allah will bring a people whom he loves. When I hear Jesse Jackson, I hear a man who loves God. When I hear Pastor T.L. Barrett or Reverend Hardy or Reverend Franklin, I hear a man who loves God. So when you are consumed with the love of God, God loves you. Now look at what is to happen with that. Then you become humble toward believers. I have never seen in Nasi Asiel ben Israel the power of his ability to wage war. He has never seen that power in me because when we meet each other, we're too busy kissing, hugging. I don't mean it in no... <laughs> <laughs> when we embrace each other with love, we are humble toward each other because it is not necessary for us to show forth power with one another. When I meet you, I feel honest and true, just like a little worm. I feel so small. I don't feel like no big shot because I'm in the presence of believing people. When you saw me on Nightline, you saw a different kind of man. Didn't you? <laughs> That's a different kind of man. Yeah. Yeah. You saw a man ready to go to war. Didn't you? Well, I don't have to show you that because you're a believer in God. I'm facing the enemies of God now. Then you see coming out of a lamb, a lion. Why? Because I'm humble to the believer. 
but I will be mighty. God and God loves me and so the scripture says of us we strive hard in God's way and look now and we don't fear the censure of any censure and it's true I listen and I look at the things that they say about me and I laugh <laughs> I, 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 I tell you the truth, the best laughs that I have had in the last seven years is reading the cartoons that white folk have put in the paper with respect to Reverend Jackson and myself. They had a cartoon of me. Like a, I was like a bulldog in this cartoon. And I had my mouth open and it was red and livid and, 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 and saliva was coming down from my teeth, you know. And I had a little bow tie on, you know. <laughs> and Jesse had the bulldog boy and he was trying to hold the dog, but the dog, <laughs> the dog was about to eat up the press. The press was sitting in the chair. <laughs> <laughs> when I read that I just laughed <laughs> they had another cartoon of Reverend Jackson and myself we were hugging each other up you know he had his arm around me and I had my arm around him and he was holding up a trophy you know, it was around the time of the Oscars he was the number one actor you know what I mean performer and I was holding mine up for the best supporting actor. <laughs> then they had another one. Yeah, they had a little sign on top of my trophy saying, vote for Jesse or else. <laughs> and they had another one. Our kind looks bigger than life. I mean, a huge a man with huge shoulders, <laughs> big bow ties stretching across. <laughs> and a white man is coming out of the polling booth, and my hand is is behind my back, you know. But I look huge, and I say to him, "Oh, and and by the way, who did you vote for?" <laughs> <laughs> man says, "Ah." Uh, did you happen to vote for Jesse? Nah, nah. I voted for Mondale. And the next thing you see me with a scimitar, and I had just lopped off this man's head. You see his head tumbling off. Firecon killed him because he didn't vote for Jesse. Then they had another one. Brother Firecon, he looking huge again, you know what I mean? Well, this is the way they see a man of truth. They see me looking huge. All the men around me looking huge, you know. And they have a sign on here saying, Ayatollah Farrakhan. Vote for Jesse or else. Now, what they're saying, see, they don't realize what they're saying. The wise do. Ayatollah Farrakhan, the word Ayatollah means, Ayat means a sign. Ayatollah means a sign of Allah. This man here is standing behind the rostrum. They're saying is a sign of God. Be careful. You'll lose your head over him. <laughs> see the wise see it different, but the funniest one of all. They have me in this pick paper. I have a big sign on here saying, "Hi, I'm Louis Farrakhan." And then they have my mouth opened up, looked like a cannon, you know, <laughs> long out here like this. This is my mouth. And smoke is coming out of my mouth, meaning I had just blew somebody away, you know. And Jesse with his hand behind, one hand behind his back and his other hand in the pocket like this and said, 
And uh, we'll go on now to the next question. <laughs> Now, beloved, I've, I've really laughed heartily. But I want to say as I leave you that God has fixed it so for us that we are not afraid of their disapproval of us as long as we know that we are right. And because we are not afraid of their disapproval anymore, they become afraid of ours. You are a new generation. You represent a new day, a new world order. So lift up your heads and gird up your loins for a food is coming down from heaven that will ease our hearts and make us to know that what we learn from the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, it is the truth. Remember, after difficulty comes ease. And when you go through your trials and you go through your tribulations, don't curse God no matter how difficult it is. Say, I am from you. You are my patron. And whatever misfortune happens to be my lot in life, I will take the bitter with the sweet. I will take the joy with the sorrow. I will take the pain with the pleasure, knowing that it is you who are fashioning me. And I must come to you by the same way that you came to yourself. God bless you and keep you. Thank you for listening. Assalamu alaikum.